Okay, good evening or good morning. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, welcome to this um, meta science session on CrowdFight, uh, fostering collaboration by making visible the invisible help. My name is uh, Sara Arganda. Uh, I will be the moderator of this session. I am a researcher at the King uh, Juan Carlos University in Spain and also a co founder of CrowdFight. Um, uh, Crowdfight is an initiative uh, born during the pandemic uh, whose aim is to uh, match experts with uh, researchers that might need their help. Uh, but Alfonso Perez Cudero, that maybe can say hello if it's possible. If not, we'll see. Uh, hello, everyone. <laughs> um, he is the director of Crowdfight and he's also a researcher at the Research Center of Animal Cognition in France. And in the first part of this session, he will tell you more about uh, this initiative. In the second part, uh, Alberto Pascual Garcia, you can say hello to if you want. You don't want to. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining. Uh, he's a, um, a board member of Crowdflight and he's a researcher at the ETH uh, Zurich in Switzerland. And he will evaluate the current situation of our project and will describe our current challenges. But before that, I wanted to ask uh, to the audience uh, if they want to, if you want to leave a question, please write it in the uh, question and answer chat, and we will try to answer them later after the presentation. So right now, I give floor to Alfonso. Okay, thank you very much, Sarah. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. Okay, I hope you are seeing the slide now. Um, okay, so my job today is to tell you what is CrowdFight and why we are doing what we're doing. And this is the outline. First, I'm going to try to give you the big picture of what we are trying to do. Um, then I'll tell you why we thought it was impossible at the beginning, why we tried anyway, even though we thought it was impossible, and how we are doing it, and why after this first experience, we actually think it may be possible, even though it's not this. Um, so the big picture comes from the difference between collaboration and help. And to us, these two words are very important. Collaboration happens when two people help each other. So A helps B, and at the same time, B helps A. While help is when only A helps B. I am a sort of a biologist, and I study cooperation in animals. And these two types of interaction have different names. The first one, collaboration, is called direct reciprocity because both of them reciprocate the help, while the second one is what we call indirect reciprocity. Because for this to help, in general and um, long term, A does need to get some reward from the process. So uh, the situations in which the second scheme works are those in which actually, in some way, A gets a reward usually because somebody else is helping a um, intern. The important thing to understand here is that these two types of interaction have very different rules. Um, they both exist at the same time in any society and they work differently. Collaborations are inflexible. If we think about science, a collaboration in which both scientists benefit is very hard to establish. You need two people, who have interest in the same question and are going to end up publishing a paper together, so both of them benefit. But still, they are different people. They have different expertise to complement that. Well, in the second case, in the health, um, you don't need both to be interested in the same question. Maybe uh, researcher B needs a protocol and researcher A can help with that. And any researcher who knows the protocol is a valid uh, partner in this case. The drawback is that while the collaborations are self-sustained because both people are interested, and therefore a collaboration can emerge naturally in any uh, situation. Uh, the cases with uh, the helping cases require a community, require a set of rules where, for example, we make sure that there are not cheaters, that there are, there are not people who are getting a lot of help without giving anything in exchange. They may even require some infrastructure. Um, because of this reason, the claim I want to make is that science is extremely biased towards the left side of this slide. When we talk about collaboration in science, we always have in mind this direct reciprocity case. 
when a foundation gives a grant for collaborative projects, they are thinking that the researchers are going, are going to end up publishing together. What we think is that shifting a little bit the equilibrium towards more health, uh, towards more indirect reciprocity, would benefit science a lot, would make it more efficient, would make it uh, even more agreeable for those who, who do science, um, and that it is actually possible to do that. But as I said at the beginning, we did not think it was possible. Uh, the reason we thought it was impossible, or at least I did, are the incentives. I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail, but the incentives in science are um, what they are, publications, grants, etc., And they are not very well suited for interactions in which one person is going to selflessly help another one without getting any immediate reward. Um, but then what happened is that we did not try to solve this problem. We tried to solve a different problem. Uh, what happened was that the pandemic hit and we had an idea of building a platform just so that any scientist could help other scientists who could make an actual difference uh, fighting the pandemic. So the way it worked was the following. If you have a researcher who's already working on COVID, uh, or at least has the means to start the project working seriously on COVID, but this scientist needs something which is generic enough so that another scientist can help. So for example, this person is a literature search on coronavirus proofreading mechanism. This person could uh, write this request in our webpage, and then we have this person, the coordinator, who would understand more or less what they want, and would look for another scientist uh, who voluntarily uh, donate his time or her time to help in this request. And then we would put them in contact. The actual system is more complicated. It goes through these steps. So first, the requester makes the request. Then uh, at the reception stage, we understand what they want. We ask for extra information if needed. Then the task distribution means that we send it to many volunteers, thousands of them sometimes. Uh, we send a brief summary. And each volunteer self-assesses whether they think they are uh, capable or not to help. Then we have a person that we call the advisor who shortlists the volunteers, choosing the perhaps 10 or 20 most suitable ones. And then it goes to the coordinator who will actually pick the good one, or sometimes it's two or three, but uh, rarely more, and makes the contact and follows up to make sure that everything works in the end. So this was the idea, um, and it worked surprisingly well. Um, it grew super fast. We had more than 40,000 volunteers. We had hundreds of requests, uh, and we had many successful requests uh, in the end. The types of requests that we got are very varied from uh, people who needed reagents and uh, were put in contact with someone who could provide them to translations, access to data, and many more. An interesting thing to note is that many of these requests, while they started as something quick, concrete, uh, and one way, um, almost half of them developed into long-term collaborations, in many cases with co-authorship. So even though we started on the side of the help, let's say, in many cases, we move to the side of long-term collaborations that benefit both sides. And uh, so we thought that it would be nice to give you some concrete examples of, uh, of requests. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Um, and for example, Alberto has acted as coordinator of many requests, and maybe he can share his point of view for some of them. Uh, thank you, Alfonso. This should be prepared. <laughs> so, uh... Requests. Uh, I, I mean, I have many, many favorite requests. I would say in 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 mind. I remember, for instance, uh, one one company from South Africa asking us for help because they they developed uh, some uh, antibodies from alpaca and they were looking for a BS3 lab, which is a high security lab in which you can use uh, you you can uh, test COVID there and. This, there are very few labs of this kind in, in the world. So we were able to find a lab in Scotland that they were willing to help them. So these guys were able to neutralize the, to, to show that, that these uh, antibodies were able to neutralize the virus there. And it's now uh, following up into, into a potentially in a drug. And I like, well, I, I was also involved in one in, in which I, I particularly like 
which is the uh, an NGO from Syria that they were asking us to to help on how they could rearrange informal camps in northwest Syria, which is the area which is now occupied still by the the opposition leaders, and so it's a very uh, it's an area completely immersed in a conflict. How they could rearrange informal camps in an, in order to minimize the spread of the virus. So we set up a, a group of modelers, and this ended up also into into a, a nice paper and also into a policy report uh, with conversations also with opposition leaders in in Aleppo. And yeah, I don't know. Also, one in which uh, in Uganda they asked us for help. To, on how to use a PCR machine that they acquire for, for performing tests. And we were able to find one person uh, that, were, that was able to, to help them with this, with this training. So yeah, I don't know, they have many, many examples. What, what about you, Alfonso? Give me one favorite. Um, so on my side, for example, I coordinated one that was uh, very interesting. It was a translation. Uh, so there was a group that uh, was doing a poll to track the spread of coronavirus through polling. And they wanted to translate it to as many languages as possible. And then the way we set this up was that completely distributed. So we, um, there were like 3,000 volunteers who were uh, willing to, co to collaborate. So what we did was we set up many copies of the document to translate, uh, one for each language. We sent them and we just said, choose your document and choose your language. and then translate or review the translation of other volunteers. We had some rules of how to collaborate on this document, but it was completely self-organized. Um, and then we thought it was going to be a mess, but actually it worked amazingly well. And actually to, to give an example, so we have a system to, when, when you need to send 3000 emails, you need like a special system to send them. Um, and it takes a while, it takes maybe five minutes, not much more. And in this case, so we started to send the email um, and before, the last email was sent, some of the translations were already done. They were already, somebody translated, somebody reviewed. Um, you could see all the comments of how suggestions of, oh, I would change this sentence in this way, super polite, super, everyone super enthusiastic. Um, so it was a really nice experience because we also we saw the, the volunteers interact in real time. It was uh, really amazing. Um, and in the end, we managed to provide uh, translations to more than, I think more than 60 languages. Um, and the, the system is right, right now working, it's called Corona Survey, and they are tracking uh, co uh, COVID in many, many countries. Um, okay, and so this is maybe the point of view of the coordinators, um, but uh, Sarah has some videos prepared with other participants, um, so. Yeah, so thank you for sharing these stories, they are great. Um, so now we are going to search the videos that we recorded in a, in, in a recent symposium that we organized about the science of collaboration. Uh, these videos are from participants. Um, uh, we have to cut some of them uh, because uh, for the sake of time. So the first one, um, I'm going to start sharing the screen, uh, is uh, by uh, Fran Robson, who is a plant molecular biologist at the University of Bristol. And she, uh, in this video, she's telling her experience as, uh, sorry, as, sorry, as a volunteer. Today on social media, um, a friend shared this page on Facebook volunteer your time and skill. If you're a researcher not currently involved in COVID-19 research, you can help. And I thought, you know what? I'm sitting here at home. I'm a molecular biologist. This is something that I can do. So I, I sought permission from my boss, who very generously said that I could have all of the time that I needed to help out, which was great. So this is task 241E as it landed on my email inbox. Um, I'll just summarize for you. Volunteers were needed to do a literature search and summarize on the proofreading mechanism of coronavirus. And research ideas, including drug design, were also welcome. So 
coronaviruses are tricky. They can resist antiviral nucleosides by carefully proofreading during RNA synthesis and literally just snipping them out. So um, the research involved wanted to know more about that molecular mechanism in order to help him design um, better drugs to fight COVID-19. So the requester was Wai Lung Ng, also known as Billy, uh, assistant professor at, uh, at, in chemical biology and drug discovery at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. So he's a medical chemist designing small antiviral molecules and he wanted molecular biology advice. So I was not the only uh, volunteer. Uh, and in fact, what Billy decided to do, rather than just asking one scientist to put together uh, a review into proofreading, uh, he decided to ask a team of us coordinated by me and make it a really collaborative effort. So Billy was joined by his very talented research assistant, Khadija, in Hong Kong. And then we were also joined by Palma Roshi's lab in France, her PhD student, Clement Parry, and from Vietnam, uh, Khan Lee. Um, from Turkey, PhD student, Sinem, who was also getting to grips with having to do online tutoring for her, for, for her colleagues. And from, from the USA, Peter, who was normally working in France, but had found himself stuck in California when all flights were canceled. So how did we, how did we go ahead? So fortunately, my partner, Rob, shown in a picture here, is a software engineer, which is very handy because I am a molecular biologist, but I'm not very techy. And he suggested OK, why don't you do this using Google Docs? Might sound simple to some of you, but I've never used it myself. And it was absolutely brilliant because in real time, we could all edit, add comments, questions, um, answer questions, and also use uh, an online reference manager, Paperpile, which again was brilliant because it didn't matter where we were in the world, what the time zone was, we could just put all of the references from our research into a central Dropbox, everyone could access them, download them, read them, and then add them to the growing document. So we decided we did, divided the document up into chunks, introduction, middle bit, techie bit at the end, and we all got going. We also used Skype a lot more than I had ever done before in my life, which was zero times. Um, and, and we had regular meetings uh, I, because I was a co coordinator, usually I would choose a very nice time for Bath, UK, where I live, at 10 in the morning. But that sometimes meant that poor Peter got the, the short straw and was, was Skyping with us at 3 a.m. This is just a screenshot of one of our meetings with just a few of the eight participants. And I think we're probably trying to decide if we should give ourselves a, a deadline. So to cut a long story short, we put together all of our research and published our first review, Coronavirus RNA Proofreading, Molecular Basis and Therapeutic Targeting. And largely due to the, the ambition and determination of Billy, who was uh, our requester, who would not take no for an answer and wanted this review to, to make it into one of the top journals as high as possible, we managed to publish this last September in Molecular Cell, which has got a really high impact factor. Um, and as of today, we have Google Scholar citations up to 99. And as you can see from the matrix, there was a lot of interest on social media, something like over 140,000 um, shares, likes and, and comments so far. So there were quite a few of us and it became clear when we were writing the review that we actually had enough material for two reviews. And so we ended up publishing a second review, which just came out last month, again in a very high journal, thanks to the determination of Billy, uh, Trends in Biochemical Sciences. And we, we published our review called Nucleic Acid Based Technologies Targeting Coronaviruses, things like antisense oligonucleotides, small interfering RNAs, CRISPR technology, 
and of course something very current, messenger RNA vaccines. So this has only been out for officially just over a month, a uh, very high impact factor and we've already got a few citations and again a lot of interest uh, and shares on social media. Also, we were really fortunate in making the front cover of Trends in Biochemical Sciences last month. Uh, and that's because a friend of Palmer, uh, an artist called Luigi Russo, put together this beautiful painting entitled Messenger RNA COVID-19 Vaccine. And it shows a robot unlocking the key to messenger RNA vaccines and handing it to a medic at the front line. So obviously all of this has been personally very satisfying, good for our CVs, and hopefully, especially for the younger um, researchers involved, the PhD students, great for their career. But the reason we obviously got involved was so that we could hopefully make a difference to the pandemic. And hopefully these two reviews will help people to navigate the frankly vast body of literature that's out there, both historic literature and current literature, and hopefully that will point them in the right direction to making some more breakthroughs. Hello again. Now I'm going to share another video by uh, another um, person that participated. In, in this initiative. It was uh, Vincent Parisi. Uh, he is a director of research of a micro, microbiology lab in Bordeaux, uh, France. And in, in this video, uh, he will be um, sharing uh, his experience uh, as a requester. One second. I'm losing. Ah. I'll do that. Sorry. This is not. Okay, share screen. I'm having a problem to share this screen. Wait a second. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I don't I don't know what's going on uh but okay sir guys I'm having a problem I don't know if you prefer to oh I don't know what's happening. We can continue, perhaps, uh, Alfonso. Could you maybe follow with the with your? Yeah, I think, and I can do later. The yeah. Video. Yeah. Okay. Um. Or we can. Okay. As you. As yeah. You sorry. Can. Sorry, guys. Yeah. Okay. Um. Okay. So then I will continue. I'm sorry you couldn't see the the other video from the requester. Um. So actually, um, there is a question from Andrew Miles. Thank you very much for that question, who asks if we can do the same thing we are doing for coronavirus, but in more in general, in other fields. And I'm going to answer this exact question uh, for the next uh, five minutes. So let me share my screen again. Um, OK, so um, initially, as usual, um, we thought we would not be able uh, to extend this to any other field. We thought that uh, our system was something that could work during the pandemic because uh, of the exceptional situations, but that it was very efficient because you had um, I don't know, a PI like me, for example, uh, acting basically as the secretary of another researcher. Uh, so this is okay because we all want to fight the virus, but in general, it's not gonna work. However, uh, we were wrong and we discovered that it can work in general. And this is because there were two surprises that we did not anticipate. The first one is that this image represents what we expected people were gonna ask, which means boring and mechanical jobs. We expected people to want other people to transcribe data from a notebook or to do a search or this kind of thing. 
But what people actually wanted was very uh, technical, highly skilled uh, help. So for example, in many cases, somebody was stuck with the protocol and they wanted to chat with someone who could help them um, troubleshoot the protocol. And this is extremely uh, efficient. It saves a lot of time. Maybe a couple of hours um, back and forth in Zoom can save you three weeks of trial and error in your lab. So this creates a lot of value for the scientific community. The second surprise uh, was that we expected that the requesters would be very happy because we were helping them with the project. And they were very happy. But the happiest people probably were the volunteers. And you might think that it's because they were helping uh, in the pandemic, but this was only a small part of the story. Um, there is a very strong effect, which is the following. Um, if you're a scientist, you will know what I'm talking about. So when you're a scientist, you, you have your set of skills that uh, you have worked on for years. Everyone in your field has similar skills and everyone in your field is working on very hard problems and ve making very little progress. So basically you go to the lab every day and you fail. That's your life. Then one of these skills, you take it and you put it in a different field. So somebody needs this protocol that you master and with very little uh, effort on your side, you help this other person a lot. You see how your contribution makes a big difference. And this is something that feels really great. This is something that makes you feel, um, makes you have a real impact in the advancement, advancement of science. So even though you are not getting a direct reward in that case, um, this from a personal point of view is um, very rewarding. Because of this, we have found that uh, the system is actually very efficient and it can be expanded to other fields because of four basic ingredients. The first two are the ones I have mentioned. The requests, or at least part of the requests are what we call high value requests that um, are very efficient, save a lot of time to the, to the community. Because of this high value, um, actually the volunteers are incentivized to help because they see that their help is really useful. Then we find that it's a great way to make useful contacts. So um, in science, we are very um, encouraged to work on networking and make contacts that are very important. And usually the way you do this is you go to a conference, you go to the coffee break, you try to talk about the weather with somebody, uh, at least for me, the one of the most stressful parts of my job. This is a much more fun to make contact because you will be put in touch with somebody who needs your help. You will discuss something very concrete, very focused for whatever time, and then you will make a friend. As, as we mentioned, actually, in some cases, um, this develops in a long-term collaboration and you end up publishing a paper together, like in the case we just saw in the video. But even if that's not the case, uh, it's a great way to make a contact with another side. And finally, um, we are actually already used uh, in our culture. It's uh, very common to donate our time to the community. We do this uh, whenever we do peer review. And if you think about it, we only donate our time to control each other. So we uh, review each other's papers, we review each other's grants. So we think we just need to change a little bit uh, the idea and get used to from time to time, donating a little bit of time just to help each other to help another side. Um, so for this reason, indeed, we have already decided and we have already implemented uh, an expansion. So now we are accepting requests from any field of science. Any, anybody, any researcher um, can make a request and we will uh, find a, an expert to help them. How is it going? So the system works just like it was working uh, for COVID. Uh, it's working now. Thanks to the fact that the volunteers are still uh, enough, uh, they still show enough engagement. Um, this shows that, as I said, the incentive for the volunteers is not so much a problem. They are um, the, the incentive is enough even in the current situation. We have, however, important challenges and several limiting factors. Um, the first one is organization. Uh, we in the core team, we are all volunteers. We are scientists that have our own job, and our time is very limited. Uh, we need more funding, basically, because we have not been proactive enough until now to, to uh, get it. And surprisingly, we are having less demand than we expected. So we are giving a service for free. Uh, and still, the limiting factor is not the response from the volunteers. That, as I say, is excellent. 
is the amount of requests that we are getting. Um, this could be because our service is not as useful as we think, but the fact is that we have uh, several requesters who are coming back. They make one request, and then once it's finished, they make another. So it's obviously helpful for them. We feel that we are um, having trouble communicating what we do and sharing with the world what we are doing. And this uh, is the main challenge that I, I think we will be discussing uh, over the rest of this session. So this all on my side, um, I'm going to stop the sharing and um, thank you very much. For Hello, your I'm back again. I'm gonna try to share uh, Vincent Parisi video now uh, because uh, we think it's very interesting to, to do it. Uh, I think it's working. Is it working? Everything is fine? Okay, I will mute myself. Uh, so uh, thanks a lot for inviting me for uh, this meeting. Um, I will just start by introducing myself. So I'm working in a microbiology uh, lab and uh, we are mainly interested in pathogenic genome mobility, uh, including uh, retroviruses, replication, and uh, integration of the retroviral uh, genome into the host uh, genome. And um, when we um, met uh, the COVID pandemic, we were working on a different kind of models, including uh, pathogens from uh, humans, like uh, retroviruses, uh, bacterial, and eukaryotic and uh, prokaryotic transposases. And uh, we uh, developed uh, some uh, models for biochemical assays, recapitulating the activity of the enzymes involved in those process, uh, cell biology uh, approaches, pharmacology approaches, and structural biology. So when uh, the first lockdown uh, came, uh, what we wanted to do is to participate uh, to uh, the fight against COVID, of course, and uh, to share uh, the different models that we uh, developed in the lab, uh, focusing on uh, the entry stage of the, the, the virus, which involves a complex between the, between the virus spike protein and the ACE2 uh, receptor from the cell. And the idea was to monitor and quantify the, in the interaction and develop further uh, system to uh, select molecule able to disrupt the, uh, the complex. So uh, that's why we, uh, we asked for, to the CROFIT uh, network and uh, we asked some requests. The first one was to uh, uh, get uh, some matter, uh, biological matter, to start the project. So we asked for uh, expression plasmid and uh, JC Bloom from the Fred Hutch uh, answered to us and sent us all the plasmid required for the expression of the, the expression of the proteins. We started the expression of the protein. This led us to develop uh, in few months different models for uh, monitoring the association between the two proteins using biochemical approaches like Perldon, Alpha Screen, Blitz, and also uh, several systems like uh, VAR infectivity assays and several uh, interaction assay between the two proteins. So uh, this uh, led us to start a project for uh, uh, screening drugs against this uh, complex. We started to uh, start a, a virtual docking, um, asking a, a new request to CoFIT, and Sergio Souza from Porto answered to us and uh, developed uh, um, an in vitro or in silico model to monitor the association between two proteins, leading to a monitoring, a docking monitoring uh, systems, and uh, allowing uh, him to uh, identify druggable sites within uh, the complex between the two proteins. So this uh, allowed us to start a uh, virtual screening of molecules. So more than 70,000 molecules have been uh, screened, led us to select uh, less than 10 drugs and uh, finally two drugs that were able to inhibit uh, the infectivity of the virus in different kinds of cells. Um, we were ready to answer to new requests based on the different tools that we have developed. And we answered to uh, several requests from the CROFID uh, coming from different labs from Marseille, um, Bordeaux, but also Abidjan in Africa and also in Asia. And uh, so uh, lab asked us to, 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 to test different kind of molecules using all the systems that have been developed. And this led to the identification of new drugs and uh, especially two one 
uh, that are uh, currently under uh, studies and uh, were found to be able to block uh, the entry stage of the virus in different kind of cell, including the naturally susceptible cell uh, pulmonary cells. So, uh, as you can see, and I, I hope I convince you that the, uh, our interaction with the crucified peoples um, led to a very uh, efficient collaboration. Uh, in few months, less than one year, we were able to develop new tools thanks to the interaction with the different uh, teams from crucified. We selected drugs from about uh, 70,000 uh, initial compound and uh, several manuscripts are, uh, have been published or are under preparation. And uh, more importantly, we have one or two patents under uh, progr progress uh, about uh, those new uh, molecules that uh, can be efficient uh, on the viral replication. We are currently um, answering to additional requests based on the model that we have developed thanks to crucified interaction, especially uh, for studying the entry stage of the uh, viral replication, the role of protein, serum protein in fifth stage, and also we are currently working on viral entry. Uh, we are fully ready to, to work with all the additional people uh, that uh, could be interested in uh, the context of the new Crowfight network. Uh, so uh, again, thanks a lot. Uh, I just want to mention that in addition to new information about viral replication, uh, we also increase our own uh, collaborative network. Additional group have joined us with uh, very specific skills that were not available before in our team, like biophysics, but also in silico modelization, and of course, people that are uh, uh, experts in coronavirus replication uh, analysis and study. So again, mm -hmm. thanks a lot, and we are ready to, to answer to, to do new, new requests based on our uh, skills and expertise. Thanks. Okay, so here I'm back again. Now we are going to pass to the second part of this session. So I give floor to Pascu, who will tell us about uh, how is our current situation and our current challenges. Thank you, Saroki. So I'm, I'm going to uh, share my screen as well. And yeah, uh, a little bit. My presentation will focus a little bit more into the challenges um, and new perspectives, what we have learned so far from, from our platform. No? And what I think there's a few things that, are, that could be very relevant for, uh, for meta science. So first of all, we have recently uh, transitioned from CrowdFight COVID-19, as Alfonso explained, to a more general branding like CrowdFight, we, we extended our collaborative model to any scientific area. And in doing, in doing so, we feel that the number of requests we are receiving are still far from what we believe we, we should receive as to be a real a, a game changer no? and on this. So which are the reasons for that? Uh, Perhaps there are some obvious reasons, no? As, as someone has mentioned in the in the chat, so crowdfight COVID nineteen has a, a sense of urgency. People was really willing to help, while now if we are open to any scientific question, this is harder to to find, no? Indeed, there, before there was a clear target. It was COVID nineteen. Now it's difficult to know what we are crowd fighting if we are open to any scientific area. And of course, there was a perfect timing for, for COVID-19. And now I would say that even people is a little bit uh, tired, no? Uh, people wants to rest a little bit of science, all of those involved in, in COVID-19 as well. So, but I think that there are some um, questions that go beyond these obvious reasons. And this, I think, what could be interesting for meta science. First of all, the, the credit. So nowadays in science, we are living a very harsh competition. This, this graphic illustrates how the number of PhDs awarded uh, increases at a much faster page than uh, the number of faculty positions. So if you are thinking on working in academia, you will experience a very, very hard competition. And more importantly, how typically decisions are taken on who will get these positions are focused on a single item, which is the number of publications. So we are living in this publish or perish world. 
with, with very, very bad consequences, right? The increase of predatory journals, for instance, the rise of mis misconduct cases. So we think that a very important thing is that every little aspect of the activities of scientists should be visible. We should try to make these things visible. Um, from our perspective, the thing that we are trying to do is the most basic thing we, th we can think of is, well, let's report all the activities that our users are uh, having in our platform. So we created this community in Zenodo in which every request is recorded with a document in which we describe what happened in the request. We describe the people involved to give them credit. And importantly, we are giving them a digital object identifier with which they can, they can uh, use in their curriculums. In addition, I th we, are, we are looking a little bit forward and thinking we, we like this, this particular kind of model. You probably know a stack exchange. And in these uh, communities, this is the profile of one user. And you can very clearly see the activity of this user, how he's involved in different communities, the different batches that this person got for uh, his or her activity. And we think that this is a very important mechanism to give credit to people. And we are considering the possibility of using this kind of profiles. In our workflow, as Alfonso explained, we have very different roles. And all these roles can be recorded. Every single activity is can potentially be recorded. So what we are working now with is uh, uh, in more in the user interface uh, technology to try to give credit in every single step to users and record it in a single in a single profile. A second question is the scope. With the scope, what I mean is that. In the beginning, when we were crowdfunded COVID-19, as you can see here, these are the, the numbers of the, the number of people involved in the different steps in red that are those related with the internal organization. As you see, since several people uh, is involved in the same, in, in several roles, with less than 50 people, we were able to manage 1,000 requests or not currently more with the help of tens of thousands of volunteers. Now, when we transition to CrowdFight, we were expecting increasing one order of magnitude. This is what we would say that we are really a game changer. However, we are not at that point. And, sorry. And we think that one of the reasons is that increasing the scope, we have reduced the feeling of belonging of our users. And this is also uh, translated in, in the social dynamic. The social dynamics that does not feedback uh, as fluently as before. The sense of community perhaps is being lost with this increase in the scope. And so we are considering now perhaps to rebranch the uh, CrowdFight into to, to redesign CrowdFight using different different branches no? for instance focusing on particularly urgent uh, questions like climate change or in a small communities that may help us to spread the uh, spread the the project in word to mouth uh, manner perhaps supported through partnerships of scientific societies foundations that will help us to feed these these communities Another question is about engagement and scaling up. I think that uh, when, we, when you're working in a project like this one that you feel that it's really important and that we tend to think that the things will happen naturally, organically, and that nothing else should be done. But think that users spend a lot of time in front of a screen. And so in a way we need that this interaction with their screens are interesting. And let me come back to this profile of a stack chain and to emphasize that some of the of the batches that this person is is getting are 
in a way fun, no? This person is a guru, is a citizen patron. These are things that, well, perhaps for a, a it's not, it's too informal for a, an evaluation agency, no? But I think that we could try to work in this direction and to start also to, to look at least for solutions similar in a spirit, perhaps more formal that, than this, no? But I think it's important to, to get this, this kind of uh, incentives for the users. And indeed, one thing that we are considering is that if we would be able to increase this uh, number of requests one order of magnitude, the next bottleneck would be here in these steps in which we is one of the distinctive uh, traits of CrowdFight that these steps here, the advisor and coordinator steps are done by scientists that we trust. We know them, we train them, we know that they are doing their job properly, but it's heavily centralized. So we could transition to a model in which we have just this final step, let's say a checkpoint of quality, which is centralized, and we could try to transform these two steps here in which, uh, in a way, to use uh, volunteers as well as advisors in a self-organized manner. How could we convert helpers into advisors? One possibility would be to create peer-to-peer -peer games. So since volunteers are those that are answering to our requests, we could use them to evaluate the requests themselves in a peer-to-peer -peer manner in order to build a consensus answer. Then a comparison between the answers that everyone has uh, provided and the consensus answer give us a very easy way to evaluate its, uh, its volunteer participating and to incorporate their responses and to give a score of the importance of, of, their, of their responses and in this way increase their reputation. So we think that this could be a way to scale up and also engage users in this kind of, of platform. And to finish, I would like to just mention one of, the, of our main challenges, which is funding. Uh, when we started, we were saying, well, we have to do this, it's important, who cares about funding? And indeed, all CrowdFat members are volunteers. Most of our members work on public institutions. That is not uh, trivial because there might be incompatibilities to do other stuff. And it's a non-profit organization registered in Europe, which is somehow relevant as well, because in Europe, I think we do not have the culture of donations that is happening, for instance, in the USA. So indeed, we do care, because if we want to scale up, uh, the organization is running for costs that might be unaffordable if we grow. And we really think that professional staff is needed. And we are doing the basic things, uh, of course. We are... Uh, asking for donations. We have in our website, you can donate. We also have merchandising you can, you can buy. And we are asking for public and private grants. Uh, for instance, our main funder so far is the European Open, uh, <coughs> open uh, Source uh, Cloud. And still, we think that we, we need more, more funds to, for the long term. So we, we wonder no, if it is a free and independent service viable. No? Uh, indeed, Wikipedia could be one of the models that we would like to follow, but it might be an exception more than a rule. So should we, should we perhaps transition to a hybrid model like many open source uh, software companies in which part of the services are free and part have a cost? So I think we are, these are things that we are also eventually considering. So as take home messages, I think that the four things are credit. I think it's important to make visible in science, the invisible help, the invisible activity. The scope, if you have a, one organization of this kind and you want uh, to have a nice social dynamics, perhaps sometimes a small community is better, less is more. To scale up, scale up your organization, perhaps social interaction and engagement are important questions to consider. And funding, this is an open question for us as well that uh, we will be very happy if you can give us feedback on that.
So if you want to help us, uh, of course, you can sign up as in CrowdFight as helper. You can make a request. You are very welcome. Please tell people about us. If you can give, invite us to, to give a talk, donate, give us feedback and ideas. I will give you uh, our Slack channel in the chat as well if you have further questions uh, that we are unable to answer now. And I will finish to, with a big thank to the core team. I can tell you that uh, the, all these people have slept very few hours during the pandemic. And a big thank as well to the CrowdFight helpers because they are our community and without them, we cannot, we cannot uh, perform our service. And thank you for your attention. So I will stop sharing now. And yeah, we will be very happy to, to answer your questions. Yeah, so there are a few questions. I'm gonna read them and you can choose who answer, okay? So the first one is, did you have any pathological or otherwise destructive requestors? And how did you manage that? So maybe I can take this one. Um, so in general, I would say very few. The, the, the general impression I want to emphasize is, is super positive. Uh, requesters are usually extremely grateful at the end. Um, actually, this is one of the things that is best about what we are doing, the, the feeling that you get at the end of a request when everyone is super happy. Um, we have had um, some case uh, where there was a conflict. It's well below 1%, uh, so it's, it's very rare. Um, and in these cases, uh, so what happens is we have very little actual uh, power because we are so we basically make contact between people but we have little um little power after that so what we have decided to do um which i think is the best we can do is to try to set the expectations as clearly as possible um so we we are trying to clarify a, a bit more what is expected from the interaction what kind of ethical rules should uh, be followed and so on and so forth um, we always emphasize people, uh, the, both the requester and the volunteer, to discuss the details of the collaboration in advance. But besides that, we try to set ex clear expectations. Um, we are also trying to survey more actively, so to ask actively whether there are any conflicts. Um, sometimes not directly, but make questions that would um, make conflicts visible so that we are aware. Um, and then we are also considering ways to. In, in the case that actually, yeah, um, it might arrive a case where we want to basically ban a given requester because we think that their um, behavior was unacceptable. Uh, this is very hard to do because who decides? Um, but actually we are considering, for example, something which could be agnostic um, in the sense that at the end of the request, we send a little survey both to the requester and to the volunteer to ask how it went. Um, whether the requests were solved and so on and so forth, and how kind, how nice people were. Uh, what we are thinking is we could implement something where if a volunteer says that you were not good, then I'm sorry, we, we don't judge, but you cannot make another request, given that the service is for free and this is more um, like something you get um, than a right or whatever. Uh, it would be okay that if you don't get a very good rating, then you cannot come back. Um, this is not implemented yet. These are just ideas, and we haven't. So we are we are working on them. But um, as I say, it's very rare to have any conflict. In general, the response is extremely positive. Um, so we are implementing this, but um, yeah, it's not not yet finished. Thanks, Anton. So uh, we have a ranking of questions with the likes. So I'm just following this. <laughs> so uh, Rose Franzen is asking. Uh, well, has a long question. While ensuring the documentation of the work done is, in, is an important step, I think perhaps one of the bigger issues is that oftentimes the invisible work, especially if it is coordination related, data management, library science work, ATC, is undervaluated with, within academia, not seen as a valuable scholarly contribution, at least in terms of prestige, status, promotion, etc. Do you have any thoughts on that? And upon whether or not increasing credit documentation alone will be enough to increase incentivation? Who wants mm. to 
Alberto, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think it's completely it's com it's completely right. This this question. It's what we are offering is what we are suggesting is that documenting is a necessary condition. Of course, it's not sufficient because the evaluation agencies should start considering other kind of activities. I think uh, little by little this is changing. For instance, in the European Union, at least uh, it's mm, more and more important to have outreach in, in, in our uh, scientific activity. And what we hope is that if we make visible these uh, invisible steps, this will start having more presence also in the CVs of, of people and people will start putting this forward. And I think this is something that I don't know if uh, in, in the short term, perhaps it's just uh, the drop that, you know, balance towards one person or the other one. But we hope that at least in the long term, this will change our vision of what excellence means, which by the way, there is a session on that uh, after our session that uh, might be very interesting to follow. Great, thank you, Alberto. Um, so we have another interesting question uh, by Monia Baker. She's asking, can you compare contrast crowdfight with other ways that researcher could ask a stranger for help, like protocols.io, Twitter, cold email, various targeted Slack conversation? What else? Yeah, I could perhaps uh, say a few words on this. I think that the most uh, perhaps in, um, important uh, signature, let's say, of crowdfight is that is these steps that are centralized, that there is people behind looking for the right expert for you. So this will not happen randomly. Of course, you can, you can have an idea of who is an expert and you can write an email to this person and this person may ignore you and may ignore us as well, of course. But the, the good thing is that with the help of the helpers, uh, we have a very large variety of experts that may help this person. And sometimes the first one does not work, but the second one will work. And another interesting feature, I think, is that this is happening uh, in a way it's private. So there is people that it's perhaps a little bit more uh, reluctant to share their research or, or to ask for help. And this is an easy way to do it. I think it's a very very convenient in this way, in this sense. I would, I would like to add a thought to this, um, just because, um, so the question uh, mentions two specific um, ways, um, and we have been thinking about them. So Twitter, that's great. Many people get a lot of good help there, but uh, it correlates a lot with how popular you are. So it's great for famous people, but if you are not famous, it doesn't work so well. And the other is cold emails, which means you just send an email to someone who doesn't know you and you ask for help. We should be doing this. So sometimes when a request is hard, we do this. We send an email to someone who doesn't know, uh, who doesn't know us and people actually respond and they are very helpful. Um, so here is a question of culture. People are not used to just asking for help. And even if this is the only thing we do, um, like uh, change this culture, I think we will be successful. It's just, uh, so sometimes it's, it's just changing the mindset. It's not that we are doing something particularly special. Great, thank you, Alfonso. Um, we have a comment, and I think you probably want to comment something about that. Uh, it's uh, by Andrew Miles, and here, this is more uh, of a comment. A theme of this conference has been the need to improve the methodological rigor of science, possibly by putting subject matter expert into contact and collaboration with methodological expert. It seems to me that there would be a huge market for a platform like Crowfight that could facilitate this connection. So feel free to comment on a comment. Yeah, I, I completely agree that this is true. Actually, I think that a little bit is what happened in the video of Vincent Parisi. He was seeking for a computational biologist expert and he found it through Crowdfight. But let me, let me tell you one example we are considering as well, which is uh, in a way similar to, this to what this person is commenting, which is crowdfight uh, fake news. I think it would be as well a good way to look for experts that 
determine whether a new that is being willing to be to be published uh, is uh, scientifically sound or not. Great. So, very last question um, from Olavo by Olavo. Can you give a general panorama of uh, the main kind of scientific field skills that are currently included in the request, just to give an idea of how community specific the platform at stake has been? Like, yeah, you get the yeah. So, I would like to emphasize um, we we have no limits to any field. We accept requests from any field. We have accept volunteers from any field, even non scientists. Um, but it's true that we have a very strong bias to biology, and especially would say molecular biology and bioinformatics. Those have, have been, I think, uh, the most, maybe 80% of requests uh, are in those areas. Of course, virology, et cetera, but uh, yeah, I would say those are the heaviest. But again, every field is welcome uh, in crowdfunding. Great. So I think we don't have any more questions on this time. So we want to thank everyone for being here, both of you for giving this uh, great talk. Uh, and I hope everyone enjoyed as much as I have done, and probably you. Um, that's probably all. Maybe see you soon in another meta science or science of collaboration meeting. Right. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.